My name is Spencer Fluman. I am the executive director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University. And uh, for all of us at the Maxwell Institute, uh, thank you for making time in your, uh, in your day to be with us. Thank you to all those who have traveled to be with us, consultation members, all those behind the scenes, um, our uh, fantastic scholars uh, here to advise and mentor our consultation members who you've heard from today. Grateful to all of you. Grateful especially uh, now uh, to Dr. Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. I was humbled. I was humbled when our conference organizers asked me to introduce our featured speaker. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ulrich is certainly among the most accomplished and celebrated scholars in Latter-day Saint history. She is, of course, 300th anniversary university professor emerita at Harvard University. She was educated at the University of Utah, at Simmons College, and at the University of New Hampshire. She taught history at New Hampshire and Harvard for nearly four decades. Her scholarship has won virtually every prize a historian of the United States can win, including the Pulitzer and Bancroft Prizes. She's been a widely recognized leader and innovator in the field of early American history for decades, serving as president of the American Historical Association in 2009. Many in this room, myself included, and scores more throughout the world have been grateful recipients of her mentoring, her generosity, and her warm friendship. Those of us who are better scholars and better people for having associated with her, thought it proper to honor her retirement from Harvard with a consultation and conference that supports the work of a brilliant next generation of women scholars. Her title this afternoon is Making History. Friends, please join me in welcoming Dr. Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. Thank you, Spencer and Kate and Lori and all of those who've been involved in this wonderful two-day experience. I know it's been longer than two days for the, the scholars who are here, the young scholars who are here um, launching a three-year project supported by the Maxwell Center. And, and just the thought of the Maxwell Center at Brigham Young University supporting this three-year initiative to nurture brilliant, young, younger, and, and some not necessarily chronologically younger, but moving anew into the field of women's history is very, very exciting to me. And as someone who has had many years as a teacher and mentor, to graduate students. This is just a perfect way to kind of commemorate my retirement and also kind of snag me a little bit here. I feel like I've uh, acquired uh, a few other folks that I will happily try to encourage in, in whatever way I can from a distance as they move on uh, with their work. Now, when Kate asked me uh, to do this um, a couple of years ago, maybe, as I was contemplating uh, retirement, um, we were originally going to have the conference in February. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the trip is much better. And not only is it much better, but the kind of coincidence of Many of my relatives, including some that I haven't seen for a long time, being here to support me, and that means a lot to me, in part because I'm going to be a little bit personal, actually quite a bit personal, in um, this talk. So I, I titled the talk Making History, and that is a very explicit allusion um, to well-behaved women seldom make history. <laughs> that, that crazy slogan, that crazy accidental slogan that's come to characterize me in 
the eyes of a certain segment of the world's population. <laughs> and uh, I thought it would be kind of interesting to talk about the interweaving of the ways in which I personally have tried to make history through my extracurricular activities, through my life, through the, my membership in the Ch Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, my membership in women's groups and women's communities, alongside that other part of my life where I've been a scholar who's focused very much on the past. So I think all of us as human beings make history, whether intentional or not, by the way we live our lives. If we do nothing, we make history. We, we contribute to the entropy of the universe in some way. <laughs> but um, making history by living our lives. And then some of us make history of a different kind by saving documents, keeping diaries, gathering family records, and turning some of those records into books and stories that we pass on to other generations. So I'm, I'm going to start by just doing a, a more conventional kind of uh, informally. Here are some of the ways that I have made history over the last 50 years. And I, I want those of you who are particularly students or just in early stages to really notice you know, I'm, I'm really old. <laughs> I mean, this has been going on for a long time. And even before I began the process of contributing to scholarship, I, I was well along in time as well. So I, just to make it clear, I was born in 1938. I graduated from high school in 1956, graduated from the University of Utah in 1960, and I want you to think about these dates. BA, 1960. MA, 1971. PhD, 1980. Um, yeah, <laughs> several decades and five children in along the way. So I'm part of a particular generation that really can't add, give advice to younger generations about how to combine their, their lives and the, uh, whatever professional work that they want to do because I am in this transitional generation that really lived two lives. The life of the very post-World War II, very domesticated woman, a miracle to finish college. I was pregnant and graduated in the spring and gave birth to my first child that fall. So that was one world where none of us were thinking of what was going to follow in the 60s and 70s and 80s in terms of transformation in the world around us. So there, there, are my, there are my books in which I am the primary author. So there are five works of American history. The first book of concentrating on the 1600s to the early 1700s. The second one, just the immediate post-revolutionary period in the life of Martha Ballard, then skipping down to 2001, a book that's really a material culture book about American Indian textiles and colonial American textiles. 2006, a response to the reaction to the slogan. And then finally, coming back to my roots as a Latter-day Saint and writing a book on early 19th century Mormonism. Now, the books that I didn't comment on up there in the corner in 1995, 
was a collection of essays written with, and these were essays in which Emma Lou and I were trying to come to terms with a very, very difficult period for women in the history of the church. And we brought our essays together in a little publication called All God's Critters Got a Place in the Choir. It was an attempt to heal ourselves and to offer ways of healing to other people in the community. Whether it worked that way, I don't know. But what it highlights, huh? It was one of my favorite books. I bought it when it first came out. Thank you. One of the, one of the points here, however, it's an interesting way in which in the sequence of these, in which I'm the primary author, um, there is that book standing there and it's very different. It is not a work of history. It's a personal essay in which I'm talking about the here and now at the time and about my own life. And for most of my career, I've been very careful to distinguish between those two things. The women's movement of the 1960s and early 70s taught us that the personal is political, and it is. The way we live our lives deals with issues of power and power relations in the larger society. But there also was so much anxiety about women's history and history of African Americans and history of Indians and so much pushback. Oh, it's about activism. It's not really scholarship. That we had to learn to really be careful, even though we knew that books about great white men founding the revolution could also be deeply personal and polit political. But as newcomers to the world of scholarship, we were constantly being watched. Is she real? Can she measure up? Can she make a difference? in the world. And I want to just tell you one little story about that and about how much I had internalized that. In 1991, shortly after A Midwife's Tale was published, and I had won a couple of awards from historical organizations, and I was feeling just so validated. And I thought, great, now I can relax. And, you know, I can just get back to my ordinary life. And I was sitting in my office, and the telephone rang. I had a student in my office at the University of New Hampshire. And the telephone rang, and a voice on the other end of the phone shouted, Pulitzer! And I said, who is this? <laughs> And the voice on the other side is Jane, and it's true. We don't know yet whether it's history or biography. And it was my editor, Jane Garrett at Knopf, calling me to tell me that it had just been announced. And within seconds, there was a photographer at the door of my office. It was the university had just heard this news and they came running, oh, one of our own. And you know, all pandemonium broke loose. And then the phone rang and it was a reporter for the New York Times. And this man said to me, oh, you know, I introduced myself and we talked. He said, can you tell me a little bit about the importance of your work to the larger field of history and how it might change it. <laughs> and I said, well, it's a book about an 18th century midwife that nobody had really taken seriously. And I was very interested in, you know, I was kind of stammered, stuttering. I, I didn't think about it being transformative in history. And he said to me, I think you're going to have to get over that. <laughs> and I've thought about that a lot. 
Um, and I think it's something, it, w it was a total, a total surprise. Um, we don't have much control how, over other people respond to our work. And at the time, people were saying to me, I love a Midwest tale. Can you suggest some other books that do similar things? And I said, sure. And I could give them a list. But those books hadn't sort of hit the jackpot, the lucky spot, where a Pulitzer is a big deal because the, most of the Pulitzer Prizes are given to newspapers. And so people know about it. It's a lot of publicity. And it really can transform your life. And it's not scholars nominate, but a, a different group chooses. And I've been on those nominating committees. And I know sometimes, boy, I just weep at the books they choose. And I know not every book that wins a Pulitzer Prize is one your fellow colleagues would uh, admire. But you get known. And that becomes a big deal. And I was very uncomfortable in a lot of ways with that. And for a long time, felt like I had to answer every letter and note I got from anybody telling me how much they loved A Midwife's Tale. They either vacationed in Maine, they'd had a baby with a midwife. <laughs> you know, I don't mean to demean that at all. But um, it was a book that for many reasons, at that moment in time, reached a broad general audience and went beyond scholars. And I'm very grateful for that. Uh, very, very grateful for that. It's giving me opportunities I may never have had. But what I want to emphasize today, and I want to do that in particular because of the experience that we've had together, a number of us, in workshopping beginning proposals at a point where people don't know where they're going or whether they're ever going to get to the end of their project and what their project, what might become of their project. But we've also, I think, I can speak for everyone that I've spoken to that participated in this um, workshop we've really enjoyed each other. And I've come away feeling affirmed and optimistic. And I think most of the participants have. We've made friends, and now for four years, the scholars are gonna to get to know each other. And, and like Anne and Colleen, they're gonna become lifelong mentors to each other and friends. And the point I want to emphasize here is we can celebrate individual works we can celebrate individual scholars, but good scholarship, good lives are collective enterprises. They, are, they involve relationships. And I'd like to just take you on a little tour through some of my experiences to talk about that. And I want to start with the necklace I'm wearing. I don't know if you can see in the back. Isn't this cool? It's a fabulous uh, beaded pair of medallions hanging from a beaded wire around my neck. And I received this necklace, I, uh, I think, of around a year ago when I was participating in Ann Browdy's wonderful women's studies in religious program at the Harvard Divinity School. And as advisors to the program, we were there to listen to the five participants give progress reports on the work that they had done while at Harvard. And afterwards, we were gathering for some food and I went, went up to Damaris Parsonel, um, who was one of the scholars, and she was wearing this necklace. And this beautiful woman from Kenya who was working on an extremely difficult project. 
in Kenya and had shared some of her struggles with that project. It was just standing there and I said, Tamaris, that is a beautiful necklace. Where did you get that? And she said, would you like it? <laughs> And I said, oh, no, I wasn't asking you to give it to me. <laughs> I, I just wanted to know about it. She said, well, it was made by the women in my charity. These were women who had suffered abuse. And um, she was working with in Kenya. Some of them were students at her university. And they were doing projects, creating some of this traditional beaded Maasai jewelry and we're trying to get in the process of being able to sell this uh, um, loan and I said oh to happily purchase some of this and she said no I don't really have anything right now but I'm going to take this home and clean it and I'll bring it back tomorrow and nothing I could do could talk her out of doing that she came back the next morning with two necklaces and a tote bag and insisted that I take them. Um, it was such a moment. Uh, I, I will never forget her. And a um, uh, beautiful lesson of generosity, but also a lesson of a scholar at Harvard pursuing a professional goal in her career who is working with a group of women in her home setting to try to help them improve their lives. And that is the experience that I've had in my life as well. So, I talked about 50 years, and 50 years would bring me back to about 1964 when I was living in um, Massachusetts, in the Cambridge Ward in Massachusetts. And we, we had been away about a year. My husband briefly took a job in California, and we came back. And our bishop got a great idea for a fundraising project for Relief Society. And he said, you know, I just worry about all these young people who come back here to school and are miserable for two years. And then as they begin to start enjoying it, it's time for them to graduate and go home. And wouldn't it be great if we wrote a little guidebook to the Boston area that could help people be happier? And I said, oh, I'd love to work on something like that. And my friend was at the same dinner party where this was discussed, who was the Relief Society president. And she said, yeah, what a great idea. He said, I will take it to the ward council. So they went to the ward council. And the elders quorum presidency who were there, who incidentally it made it just delicious because they were students at Harvard Business School, said, that will never make any money. Bad idea, it will not work. And my friend Bonnie said, the Relief Society will do it. <laughs> and we did. And over two editions of that book, we sold uh, 20,000 copies, <laughs> got rave review in the Boston Globe. It was done collaboratively. I was the editor, but everybody contributed the research and the work. People contributed art. People contributed layout. The bishop's wife typed it on this electric typewriter. We pasted all the labels by hand took it to an offset printer, and that process was just newly available. And by reducing it to 60%, it looked like type. And we had it photo offset and bound, and nice looking little book. Some of those you can probably still find on uh, the internet. They're really collector's items now. Now, that was a church project. Men helped but it was organized and driven by women. And the Harvard Business School students were right. 
It did not make money. That is, if we had paid ourselves, it would have made very little money. But we didn't pay anybody. It was one of those great Mormon projects. And it did buy a lot of important things. And an important part about that was the Relief Society controlled the money. <laughs> So that was empowering. So what you have on the screen up here is the Exponent 2 coloring book. Have any of you seen it? And this, this is supposedly me with the big glasses holding a beginner's Boston. And next to me is Claudia Bushman holding Mormon Sisters, really the first published book on 19th century Mormon's history in the modern uh, Mormon feminist era, and then Exponent 2, founded in 1974, and Judy Jishku is holding that. And every one of these projects was a collective project of a group of women who enjoyed each other's company, stayed up talking, pasting up things. We, ha we learned how to publish. We also learned how to write, and we learned how to market. And then, what next? And people went in a lot of different directions. I went to graduate school, and there are my friends, 1974. I was in New Hampshire, we had moved, so I'm not in that picture. They're all climbing on John Harvard's statue in the Harvard Yard. I mean, that's how cheeky we were. <laughs> There we are, look at the long skirts, very much in style in 74. And there we are, not we, I'm not in that, photoshopped. <laughs> Nobody's brave enough to climb on that statue now. Um, in uh, the 40th anniversary of the Exponent 2, which is still being printed, um, ordinary women dealing with issues in women's lives dealing with issues in our own faith, in our own faith communities, building each other's courage to go on for the next step in our lives. Okay, so I come to Harvard University in 1995 as a full professor, which means I can teach whatever I want, do whatever I want, and it was a mess. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, I had risen through the tenure ranks at New Hampshire. We had managed to finally get some other women on the faculty. We had a really good department going. I come to Harvard, 10% of the tenured faculty at Harvard University in 1995 were female. I was the first woman tenured at, in the history, American history, at Harvard University, 1995. Wow. It was like stepping back 30 years from a state university in terms of diversity of faculty. I could talk for another half an hour <laughs> about what that was like, but I want to talk about what happens when women with a little experience get together with other women and try in a small way to make a difference. So Harvard renovated a new building and a beautiful new building, and it was a humanities center, so it was going to contain the women's studies program, the English department, and a number of other, and then languages and other departments of gorgeous, um, very early 20th century building in neo-Georgian style, gonna to be totally renovated, big splash, big welcoming. I went into the building, of the day before it was going to be opened, and I walked through the building and I felt just like uh, Virginia Woolf 
in the room of one's own, walking into the library at Oxbridge, seeing the portraits looking down at her, saying, who are you? There is no place here for women. No women. So the open house celebration went pretty well. Um, nice poetry reading by one of the female English professors and so on. They introduced the project manager for the renovation, a tall, elegant woman with red hair, woman project manager. I mean, really, fabulous. And so I couldn't resist. And I walked up to her and I said, lovely job, you know, congratulations. Um, I wonder if I could ask you a question. Um, did anybody talk about including some portraits of women in the rooms? And she said, well, of course people talked about it. At Harvard, we talk about everything. <laughs> and I said to her, well, why, why are there no portraits of women? And she said, well, first of all, there was a lot of controversy about renovating the building. And we knew that some people were going to be more comfortable if there was not too much change in small details. And besides, Harvard has no portraits of women. I said, really? Harvard has no portraits of women? What about Radcliffe? The, the women's supposed college long attached to Harvard. I said, no, nothing we could use. And then she looked at me. She, she didn't know who, who I was, that I was a faculty member. I mean, she probably would have been surprised because there weren't very many of them. Anyway, she looked over at me and said, you can't rewrite history. That was all I needed. <laughs> so I went to work. I started doing research. They had handled a little pamphlet giving history. Um, and it was terrible. There were no women in the pamphlet either. You know, all about the famous men who had inhabited this building before and had been in the various departments. So I wrote this really, you know, feisty essay. I sent it off to Harvard Magazine. I can't honestly remember if they just ignored me or if they openly rejected it. <laughs> but anyway, so a few weeks later, I happened to be talking to a group of women who were involved in some kind of project. Um, obviously for funding, because women's money is also welcome. And um, I told them this story, and um, two days later, I got a personal message from the editor of Harvard Magazine saying, I understand you have a very interesting article, <laughs> and could we take a look at it? And so in 1999, they published my article with beautiful illustrations all over of women in Harvard and Radcliffe's past, and with my title, Harvard's Womanless History, completing the university's portrait, suggesting things that we could do. And I am so grateful to Harvard Magazine. We've, we've developed a good relationship over the years, and when I retired last year, they republished this article with a nice little tribute on their online uh, uh, website. Um, and it was such a moment, but it wasn't enough, of course. So I had been asked to um, chair the Charles Warren Center, which was a, a center for bringing visiting scholars. But it was also a center that had a little money to fund student research projects. So it occurred to me that I could go to the Schlesinger Library, 
uh, which was a library on the old Radcliffe campus. Actually, Radcliffe still existed in 99, although it was totally absorbed into Harvard in 2000. And asked if the Schlesinger Library would team up with the Charles Warren Center and fund student projects on gender in Harvard and Radcliffe history. And that is kind of a long story, but it's a follow-up story. And it's a follow-up story very much like this, where those of us, some visiting fellows, some younger faculty members, alums, um, scholars who were in residence at the time at Harvard, the archivists, and then some wonderful undergraduates, both male and female, who got these summer research grants, went together and we actually put on two conferences where people presented their work and then we eventually were able to get, Harvard University Press was not at all interested in our book, uh, but we got Palgrave Macmillan and published this anthology, Yards and Gates, Gender in the Harvard and Radcliffe History. Now, it was a scholarly work, it was a work of teaching, but it was a work of collaboration by groups of people who cared about the project and moved on. Now, where did that come from? It came from my investment in women's studies at New Hampshire. It came from my interest in the larger women's movement. But ultimately, in my life, it came from my involvement since the age of 18, and prior to that as an observer of my mother in Relief Society. <coughs> It came from a can-do spirit that I am so grateful I inherited and was tutored in as a young woman and that I was able to follow through with in young adulthood. And so even though I kept my private life and my religious activities in one part of my world and my professional work in the other, I think the habits and the practices and the values work together. I didn't mount a protest campaign at Harvard because it wouldn't have done any good. I'm not object to protest campaigns. But I said to myself, here I'm giving you advice. <laughs> Notice, I'm giving you advice. <laughs> What are my resources? Who do I know? How can I help? How can I pay forward the kinds of things that have been given to me? Um, so a second co-authored project, I'll just comment on very, very briefly. And this is a, a co-authored project with um, three other colleagues, one of whom was my former graduate student, one was a curator in one of the museums and the other was a curator in another one of the museums. I was very interested in material culture and artifacts and Harvard had such an amazing array of those things. But in order to access them and to learn, I needed help from people who really understood the collections. And I had grown to have immense respect for the curatorial staff in those museums who were often treated not very well in a university where tenured faculty were God and people further down the line. One of my co-authors won an international prize for her scholarship in the history of science and the department chair in the department responsible for the museum where she was the curator would not allow her to take time off work to go receive her prize in England. But no, that was just mean. There was no reason to deny that. It was just wanting to keep her in a particular place. 
And yet I found the colleagues that I learned the most from were often those who were doing that kind of, like people in archives and libraries, often doing some of the most fundamental and important work done in the university. And so we, we did a wonderful big project together and if you're that interested you can find websites and you can find um, on edX free online courses for some of the work that uh, we have continued to do um, free online courses in working with artifacts as subjects in history. In fact, the latest of those courses done in conjunction with the Schlesinger Library is called Women Making History. And I think Kate confessed she stole, or maybe it was Laurie, stole the title. <laughs> <laughs> in honor of me. <laughs> okay, go look up the website. You'll make the people at edX very happy. All right, so I guess I'm, I'm just making the larger point. I could keep going. I could go on and on. Um, in every one of my scholarly projects, there's been a powerful community support system that I didn't create, but that I was fortunate enough to be able to tap into and rely on. And of course, always the libraries and the archives are there, including the state libraries and the registry of deeds and the many people who take care of the records that historians rely on. With a midwife's tale, it was communities of lay midwives in Maine and New Hampshire that helped me a lot, and especially when we got to the film, who worked directly on set to help train the uh, actress who was playing Martha Ballard as she officiated in deliveries. One of the best experiences I ever had giving a speech was at uh, the American College of Nurse Midwives in Phoenix, Arizona, a few years after A Midwest Tale was published, and there were 5,000 nurse midwives and lay midwives in that room. Talk about power. <laughs> and I didn't have to say anything. I would just give them a little statement about Martha Ballard and they would clap and cheer. <laughs> I felt like I was running for president. <laughs> and the spinners, the weavers, the embroiderers, the basket makers, the Native American collectors of baskets. Wouldn't have been that book without them. And then, of course, all the crazy people. <laughs> all the crazy people. Now, that quotation came from the first paragraph of my first published scholarly work. I published it, and it was a graduate seminar paper that I revised again and again and again. And in the first paragraph, I, I just said, well-behaved women seldom make history. When I got known, 20 years later, a journalist picked up that quote and used it as an epigraph for a little popular book she published. Somebody picked it up from her, put it in a book of quotations. A young woman in Oregon saw the book of quotations, looked up my name on the internet, contacted me and said, Professor Ulrich, I have a little com company printing feminist t-shirts. Could I use your quote? And I said, what quote? <laughs> <laughs> and she told me, and it took me a while to think, where did I say that? <laughs> and I found it, and I said, Sure, send me a t-shirt. <laughs> I mean, if you know my book, you know it got totally, totally crazy. And it's gone in waves. And in the last month, <laughs> uh, 
I had a woman in England email me to thank me for my marvelous influence and my fabulous quotation and to tell me that it was tattooed on her upper thigh. <laughs> There I am in uh, 2006 with some of the crazy stuff. But this was brand new. This just came from a television producer. Now they want to use, um, and it's amazing they ask permission, because after Jill Portugal, nobody asked permission. <laughs> it just went. And for a very brief time, I was working with an agent when I published the book, and he was a little nervous. And he started asking some of these t-shirt companies for some kind of royalty. I mean, it didn't amount to anything. And I gave up on that. It was ridiculous. There's no way you could. But some very thoughtful people will email and say, is it OK if I use this? And I always say yes. Why not? I can't control how people understand it. And very kind of them to write. And one recently wrote and said, we a uh, very nice looking product that they were working with um, stationery and said, um, we'd be ha they offered me money. And I said, I haven't been asking for money. And they said, well, we'd be happy to put a credit line, 25 words at the bottom if you want to mention your latest book or your website or anything else. So I'm, thinking about, I might do that. I'd love to sell books, of course I'd love to sell books. But um, that my, my most famous work is a single sentence. <laughs> and finally, the most recent book, I was at the Church History Library early this week and so grateful for all everything from the top down to the missionaries weighing the documents um, contributed to that work. But I was especially grateful for the kindness of Carol Nielsen, who um, in 2004 did that, published her wonderful genealogical research and her story about the discovery in her family of the 14th Ward album quilt, which has a central role in um, my, my most uh, recent book, A House Full of Females. Um, the book itself is a kind of quilt in that it's created of pieces from, wouldn't you expect, pieces from lots of people, ordinary people, things that people wrote and allowed to pass on to their descendants so that we can understand the past through the words that they left behind. And so that's really the point of this talk that I really want to make. There's such a sense that uh, we, we are a high achieving people we're out of university. We all have dreams. Um, my dream from fifth grade on was to be a writer. I didn't know I was going to write history. And the longer I was in college, although I loved school, the longer I was an undergraduate student, an English major, where we never read a a word by woman. I had two female professors. One taught methods of secondary education, and one was a fabulous poet who I later learned had been quite marginalized in the department. But I loved my teachers. Wonderful man, and I learned a great deal. But the longer I was in the university, the less I felt I had anything to say. And I did not discover 
that I had things to say until in the 60s and 70s with other women, I began to think seriously about the issues that still engage us in the world today, although it's, there, folks, there's been a lot of improvement. Mm -hmm. Not as much as I would want. Um, I'm still hopeful, and I'm even more hopeful because of all of you in this room. Thank you very much.